how do you sit down and actually help someone decide what are the areas that they need to to look at for peak performance? Yeah, it's a good question because there, I mean, performance science is really deep. There are a lot of ideas. Some of them are sort of trivial. Some of them are deeper and more impactful. And so one of the first things I had to do was say, well, what's most important that's actually here? Right? What are the most like potent ideas? Because part of the challenge with any academic field, right, that has multiple disciplines contributing to it is that it's, it gets really complicated. And yeah. most normal people don't have time to like do that parsing and figure out what's the idea that's going to be most impactful for them. Heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. From the doctor saving lives at your local hospital, the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom, to the police officers and the firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur, the creator, the producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews and today I have the pleasure of having on Dr. Carla Fowler. Dr. Carla, are you there? I am here. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So glad to have you here. I always like to start off for my audience just to let them know where we're at. We're currently in Central Florida because a lot of them know we travel and we're staying for the winter. So, you know, the next couple of episodes you'll probably see us saying the same thing. We're in Florida enjoying our time here. Where are you calling in from, from Dr. Fowler? I am also mobile, so I am calling in from Lisbon, Portugal. So later, later in the day here, um, but uh, the weather is still surprisingly great in November. So yeah, yeah, I've got a good friend of ours who is currently working on a dual citizenship with Portugal. It's because she wants to have her second home there for a whole bunch of reasons. But anyways, it, I my understanding is it is a beautiful place, and I can't wait to go visit at some point. I highly recommend it. Uh, it is. It is gorgeous and very friendly culture i like the food lots of great seafood you can also just enjoy the countryside uh, there's a lot there's surfing there you can bike you can hike um, and then lisbon is just an amazing city yeah sure and interesting things so that's awesome so what i want to do before we dive too far into the conversation is just go through a brief bio for you so our audience knows who you are and then we'll dive into your story so dr carla fowler is an md phd and elite executive coach for the last decade she has been a secret weapon for scores of ceos entrepreneurs and other senior leaders carla's unique approach combines the latest research from performance science with timeless best practices to help top performers level up and achieve their goals. She graduated from Brown University, magna cum laude, earned her MD and PhD at the University of Washington, and completed her internship in general surgery at Stanford University. That's really cool. I've actually never had a surgeon on the show before. So, so do you... I'm like one-fifth a surgeon <laughs> in the sense of, like, I, I completed one year of residency, but most surgeons that would actually Did... be on you have done a lot more. Did you actually get to cut anybody open, like for real? Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, that's terrifying. So like, I'm, I, I appreciate that people like you exist because like, if I cut my hand and I bleed too much, I'll pass out on the floor. So like, not a job for me. <laughs> it's, um, it, it is no, as we will talk about, it is no longer what I do either. Although I find that because we spend enough time in the wilderness and out hiking that I, I try to keep up some basic medical skills because like when we're in the wilderness, if I'm the only yeah. doctor around, I'm the doctor you get. My wife actually just, she's self-taught. She went and got the whole kit and training stuff for like doing stitches and whatnot. And you know, she's, she's actually quite talented at it. So if I ever slice myself open, she can fix me up or my children and whatnot. But it just reminds me, I have, I have a little scar, probably can't see it on the calendar, but it's like, or on the camera, but it's right there on my finger. And I remember I was, you know, when you clean a knife, you put the sponge over the backside of the knife and you clean it. One time I did that backwards and put the blade towards the sponge, you know, cut the knife open and my finger. I'm at home alone with my three-year-old and I, it cut almost down to the bone. And I remember holding it and just like bleeding there and being like, I'm going to pass out. 
I'm home alone with my three-year-old. I can't just like pass out, clock my head on the ground. He doesn't speak English yet. He can't call someone if something goes wrong. So like he's following me around like, what's wrong, daddy? I'm like, I'm trying not to pass out. I'm like holding, holding a paper towel on my finger and I lay down on the couch and he's like, you know, he's very concerned for me because I'm like bleeding all over the place. And I'm just trying to like breathe. I'm like, surgery is not for me. <laughs> 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 that is a good story. I am glad you're okay. Hopefully your three-year-old is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's 15 now. Um, so yeah, he's he's quite wonderful. And he has, he has uh, picked up his dad's unique skill to injure himself doing pretty much anything. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's useful. It doesn't break you. It just makes you stronger. It just makes you stronger. So I always start these conversations off with talking about what you're known for now, right? So this question sets up who you are now, what your business is like, who do you serve, what do you do for them? Great question. So I am an executive coach. I have a coaching practice called BAXA that I started 11 years ago. And I built that practice under with the intention and with the idea of taking all we know from performance science and actually integrating that into a coaching methodology to help leaders, people who are starting businesses or companies, help people actually use that in a really practical way, not in sort of an academic, you know, overly complex way but in a way that like could really help them chase ambitious goals that they're setting. And so this was an idea I had. Obviously, coaching's not new, but I came into it very much from a standpoint of wanting to create something, wanting to create something a little different and do it in the way that made sense to me. And so built a methodology and started working with folks and practice has grown over the years. And now I'm both coaching, but also love um, talking about performance science, and sharing those ideas to a wider audience. So tell me a little bit about what you mean when you say performance, because I know just in my own head, performance is one of those words that has a lot of baggage associated with it. Are you talking about performance like mentally, or are you talking about ideation? Are you talking about project completion? Are you talking about, you know, high level martial arts or some other sports kind of performance? Like where, where are you going with performance or is it all of the above? To some degree, it is all of the above with perhaps the exception of, I think there is a whole cohort of practitioners who are very focused on sports performance. And so I'm not, I'm not coaching athletes. I think there, that is an area that if one were going to do it, it makes sense to really specialize in that area. Yeah. I, now that being said, it does not mean that physiology and biology isn't a piece of coaching performing at your best, around, like performing at yeah. your best. And so I'm often working with people who are thinking a lot about, for example, decision-making how to evaluate risk, how to make a business successful. So there is a lot of mental and thought performance that's in mm -hmm. how to deal with the stress that comes from like, running a big company or how to think about where you spend your time and resources, right, and those things. So that, when I think about performance generally, I'm, I'm thinking about like what helps us do our best as human beings, what helps us go after the goals we set for ourselves and be successful at that. And again, I'm typically working with people who are in kind of the business and or leadership realm, not on that sports side. But yeah. one of the interesting things about performance science is it definitely started with athletics. Like, how do you physically yeah. perform at your best? But kind of came into and got adopted by other areas. Like, there are crossover fields. Surgery is a great example. It's got a physical art to it that you need to sort of physically be able to do the maneuvers at a very high, mm. precise level, but it also has a mental decision-making component. Right? Yeah, especially under pressure, right? Because like someone's bleeding out on the table, you got to make decisions right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even when someone's not, you have to make a decision about, you know, what are the probabilities and the prognosis if you operate on someone or don't? Like sometimes that's the biggest decision you make. And um, so there are those crossover areas. I think uh, like flying an airplane, another great example of a crossover area. There's a physical piece to it, but also a mental piece. Um, but then of course came fully into the business realm where people began to understand that you could, there was some science behind this. We can understand how our brains work as human beings, how they tend to thrive. What are some of the common errors or biases that we have? So, yeah. There's a lot of great ideas out there and these fields started to adopt them and say, oh, like, how could we use this? And it comes full circle because eventually I think 
business realm also realized that how we were functioning like physically as human beings has a lot to do with how our brains are functioning because it's yeah. the body, right? And then yeah, yeah. it turns out if you don't get enough sleep, your decision-making capacity may be impaired. Right? So <laughs> I learned so much about that over the last few years. It's, it's such an interesting conversation to me because like if I go, you know, I'm, I, I started my entrepreneurship journey when I was like 13 and I convinced my dad to give me like a, a loan to go get candy at the big box store and like, you know, hawk my wares at school, right? <laughs> Under the trench coat kind of thing. Before I got shut down by my first government agency, they told me I wasn't old enough to have a business license at 13. So I tell people I had my first government shutdown at 13. But like all the way up through, you know, building our company now, Push Button Podcast over the last five years, that there and my, my previous company, there was sort of a distinct difference about maybe seven years ago, I started looking at my physical performance, uh, like my physical health as a lever to pull for my business performance. And there was, and over the last couple of years, there's been at least three or four different categories that have had massive impacts on my ability to run a bigger, larger, more successful company that serves more people and does more good in the world. And it was, you know, I started off with, with, work like how much time i was putting into work and realizing like i was I, I was under the very wrong impression that more time spent working and equaled larger better results and was in that you know 12 to 18 hour a day trap six days a week kind of thing and burning myself out and realizing that that had massive negative impacts on my ability to be productive and you know started to solve that and then started looking into health stuff and you know i was 119 pounds until like thir until I was in my mid 30s and real and we could never really figure out why I couldn't put on weight and why I couldn't like gain muscle and stuff like that. Hired a functional medicine doctor and started fixing some of those issues, and that it it fixed my problems with insomnia and it I know I have a lot more energy during the day, much better ideation, that kind of stuff. And then started working with my son and I do martial arts together. Now we hired a a world world champion to train us, which as a looking back in the mirror kind of thing, you might not necessarily decide to hire a world, you know, world champion because they train hard. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, 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 sometimes I feel like I bit off more than we can chew, but it's also put me in some of like, like the best shape of my life, right? And I've realized that all of those categories, like learning to get my sleep right and learning to get my weight right and learning to get my eating right and learning to get my, like all of these things, as I told you before we got on the call, I've 10x the revenue in my company over the last five years, right? And I work less and I sleep more and I spend more time on those things. And all those things have positively impacted my performance. And it feels like, man, performance is one of those things that there's just so many levers to pull. And so it's interesting, like people like you who are in the business of helping people like me perform at their best, there's so much to that. How do you sit down and actually help someone decide what are the areas that they need to, to look at for peak performance? Yeah, it's a good question because it, it, there, I mean, performance science is really deep. There are a lot of ideas. Some of them are sort of trivial. Some of them are deeper and more impactful. And so one of the first things I had to do was say, well, what's most important that's actually here, right? What mm -hmm. are the most like potent ideas? Because part of the challenge with any academic the academic field, right, that has multiple disciplines contributing to it is that it's, it gets really complicated. And yeah. most normal people don't have time to like do that parsing and figure out what's the idea that's going to be most impactful for them. And so one of the ways that I, I broke it down and parsed it was to say, well, you have to figure out what are some of the most important like buckets or angles through which you can attack a problem and, and what's probably the most important principle in each of those buckets. So I, I now think in four buckets. One bucket is around strategy or focus. It's, it's this idea of, it's what you said, you had a misimpression that like working more was the lever to pull to get more mm -hmm. results and you reach the edge of that. So the strategy bucket is really about brutal focus. How can you decide what's actually most potent that you can be working on and not simply try to do as many things as possible, which often ends up diluting like what you're actually doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like strategy bucket, right? And I always, I said, you know what? I think the principle in this one is brutal focus. You really have to look for potency and get clear on what that is. I think another bucket's the execution. There's, and, and the productivity movement, by the way, lives in this bucket. And has some yeah. good things in it, but also can kind of steer us in the wrong direction sometimes. But it, more or less, like 
as human beings, there are better and worse ways to work through and actually execute on something or to help a team execute on something. So there's a lot of good ideas in there, but one of the most important things in that bucket is we have to know how to get ourselves started. We have to know how to get our team started and start to stack up hours into something. That is often what's very important. And third bucket, all about our mindset, right? That there, mm -hmm. it's the psychology of things. It's, are we feeling confident and motivated or are we not? Are we mentally burned out on something. And so there's a lot that lives in that. But I think one of the most biggest things that is a challenge is that we often have to deal with uncertainty as we're trying to do big things like growth business and um, take risks, the kind of risks that might allow you to do a 10 expert, right? Like what you've done. That's third bucket. And so I often say, hey, we have to lean into uncertainty. We have to like almost find a way to relish the opportunity that it, it represents. And there's some different ways to do that. But fourth bucket, you gotta use your biology because we aren't separate like mental, physical creatures. We actually are one big, you know, bucket of cells. And so we have to also do things that actually calm and or help with the recovery of our physical system, whether that's sleeping enough, having ways to come down off peak periods. Stress mm -hmm. is not necessarily bad, but if we view the stress as bad or if the stress doesn't have a purpose or meaning to it, chronic stress can be us, right? So there's a lot of yeah. important biology that we get to. So part of how I help people think about what they're trying to do is we work our way through the buckets. And so we start to try and get them clarity about what do you want to have happen? What's most important? Can we focus? We can then think about like, what's gonna help you execute or what's going to help you stay motivated? What's gonna help you have this be physically sustainable for you? And different people have different challenges. So we don't have to work through all the buckets for person because um, we just try and figure out what are the kinds of ideas that are going to help them. And so yeah. that's, that's kind of how I take the science, but then say, yeah, how do you help a person use that? How do you work with them together? To so useful. I love this first off, because I see a lot of things just in my own life and business that like fall into those buckets. And if you're open to it, what I'd love to do for a couple of minutes is go through and give you some of thoughts on things that, like, that I've done over the last couple of years with either my coaches or with our team and see if you might tell us a little bit about some of the science behind some of those things, how they fit into these buckets. So I have some ideas. So on the, I'll, I'll just go through each of your four buckets, right? So you said, first one you said was brutal focus, strategy, deciding what's next, that kind of thing. And so the thing that pops in my head for that and, and where, where I started to have really big shifts was two two big things for me. One was something called, or I don't know what you'd call it, but it's the idea that creativity thrives with boundaries. And the second one is micro completions. And so I'll talk about both of those independently real quick. So creativity thrives with boundaries is the idea like a painter paints on a canvas and the boundary is the canvas, right? A photographer has the window that they're looking through. And the, the, the anytime that you're working on something, it always, the boundaries that you put in place are where you see creativity thrive, right? So the less boundaries you have, the less creativity you have. And so one of the things that I started working on to solve particularly that focus problem I was having working, just trying to work so much was, well, what happens if I start putting creative restrictions on my time, right? So things like maybe instead of having an unlimited amount of time to work today, I only work eight hours a day, right? And then I cut it off at the end of the thing. Maybe instead of working six days a week, it's only five. Maybe instead of five, it's only four. Maybe instead of eight hours a day, it's six. Maybe instead of six hours a day, it's four, right? You know, I average four hours a day, four days a week now um, and run a massively larger company that provides massively larger value because of that one idea of creativity thrives with boundaries. And then what you see is it really helps you decide what you're going to do next because you're like, I've got this block that my business is allowed to have from me, right? Which is a very different conversation for what I'm going to do today, right? What am I going to focus on? It's like, no, my business is allowed to have this amount of time. What's something that I can do that's going to either unlock someone on my team or that's going to, you know, turn into a process that can happen over and over again without me, right? And it, it shifts your focus into things that allow you to snowball, which brings me to the second point, which is micro completions. And the other thing that I realized was that trying to look at, you know, for lack of a better metaphor, right? Trying to eat the whole elephant never works, <laughs> And so you have to look at what is something that I can just 
take from start to finish right now, right? And so if you're going to say, hey, I've got four hours today, and you know, I've got a couple of things, I got a couple of calls that I need to get on, I got some other stuff, I've only got an hour of time that's gonna go towards working on my business, I need to complete something, right? And even if it's like, I'm just completing the headline for an article, it's at least it's complete, right? Like I've completed a thing. And if you complete something every day, it snowballs really, really fast, surprisingly fast. So that's the first one, brutal focus on, the, on those two concepts. To creativity thrives with, with boundaries and micro completions. The second one on execution, productivity, how to get yourself started and get your team started and stacking hours is something that like I'm still looking at a lot. You know, and we were talking before we got on about our new project over in the you know, push button politics and whatnot. What we're actively doing is we're just meeting every week and talking about what needs to get done and assigning some, you know, assigning a task or two or three or maybe a phone call that needs to happen. And we don't really know what needs to happen in order for that project to be ultimately successful where we want to get. So we're just sort of exploring it and going and just getting work hours behind it. And we do that with a lot of projects. And a lot of it is like, we don't know what we don't know until we actually start looking and researching and playing and, and who do we need to talk to? And then talking to some of those people and realizing they aren't the people we need to talk to, but they know who we do need to talk to. And it's like that the act of getting an action helps with I, I love the idea of stacking hours, right? You're just stacking hours onto the project and not like, I don't want people to get the idea that you're just like doing useless things, but you're, you're actively like making forward progress on something. Yeah. Um, and then mindset, right? So confident, motivated, burned out, dealing with uncertainty, taking risks, allow for big wins. This is one of those things that like, I don't know how to describe this to people, but I think entrepreneurs are a crazy brand, bunch of people and the world needs us because we're the ones that will jump off the cliff and figure out how to build a parachute on the way down, right? And, and that's, that's uh, I used to think when I was a younger entrepreneur that anyone could be an entrepreneur. And I realized as I've gotten older that it's you know more similar to like Ratatouille and what, you know, that chef, I can't remember, it was Chef, chef Cousteau, right? It's not that, that a uh, entrepreneur, um, anyone can be an entrepreneur, it's that a, a good entrepreneur can come from anywhere, right? And it's a very specific type of mindset that is mostly a having a willingness to, to take risks that other people are unwilling to take. And to, I like the way that you learned it, you, you phrased it, lean into uncertainty and, and be comfortable with not knowing what the next steps are, but taking them anyways. And knowing that like part of the journey of getting ready is taking those steps. Like you, you, you can't wait for all the stars to align or you'll never do anything. Right. And so you, you take steps and you, you course correct along the way. And the last one, the biology, we aren't separate mental and physical creatures. One of the things that like I've realized is that like, you no, know, if I want to step up and perform as an entrepreneur and do big things and make big shifts in the world, like I need to be fit and capable and well rested and I need to eat well and I need to sleep well and I need to most importantly take time off of work. And so like this metaphor that, you know, you've probably heard the metaphor a whole bunch, right? The legal scales, right? You know, we're trying going for work-life balance and we're, you know, like the scales of justice trying to get our work and life to be like perfectly in balance. I've always hated that metaphor because I don't think it's useful. And I think what's the metaphor that I use to describe for people is I call it a the rubber band analogy that, you know, if you want forward progress, you have a rubber band, you can stretch the rubber band. And, but there's limits, right? If you stretch the rubber band too far or too long, you'll either break the rubber band or it'll lose its elasticity. So in order to have forward prog progress, you actually have to let go. You have to let go of the rubber band and it goes from a stretched state to a relaxed state. And that relaxed state is what, where you have the propel, you know, where you propel forward. And so entrepreneurs tend to, and you know, I, I just know this because we've, you know, I've done 300 of these interviews, right? We tend to look at rest and relaxation as a reward for a job well done instead of a prerequisite for showing up and doing good work. And I think if we can shift that for people, that if you start looking at rest and recreation and, and sometimes even like you're working out and you're eating and you're cooking and your sleep habits and the stuff that goes into your biology and your life and your relationships as a prerequisite for showing up and doing good work, that's what allows everything else we just talked about to happen. How you can actually perform and actually do more work in four hours a day than most people do in 16 hours, right? So anyways, that's my sort of diatribe of all my thoughts that I had as you were going through those buckets. <laughs> I love that. And one of the interesting things I know, like, there was clearly a bucket that you resonated with for each of those things the most. Some of them, I actually think, are places where you're seeing different principles cross. And that's what's mm -hmm. fun about performance science is that there are often multiple things at play. Like, for example, you know, micro micro completions. 
right? Yeah. Number one, you have to have the clarity to actually say and designate, like, what can I complete to set to set an intention, right? But also the idea of like that it feels good to complete it is very yeah, related it's to dopamine. mindset. Yeah, it's well, and re yeah, related to mindset and like uh, just how our brain feels, that positive feeling, that's the psychology of it. And yeah. because our brains don't like open loops, our brains also tend to like a, a sense of achievement. And, and so there are some of these things that are really fun because they're, cro they're crossing over yeah. different like, areas. Like multiple buckets. Also, yeah. And when we say we'll do something and then we actually complete it, our sense of self-efficacy, our confidence grows, right? So yeah, it builds an identity of I'm a completer. I'm a completer. I finish things. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the, the piece you were talking about, the team, and right now you're like, okay, it's not totally clear to us because we don't know what we don't know, like what it's going to take to do this big thing, this exciting thing that we're building towards. But what's great is, number one, you are building momentum. And mm -hmm. again, like from from mindset standpoint, like uh, part of what motivates teams is having clarity. So this is a little bit of brutal focus to say, here's what we are going to do this week. Maybe these ultimately won't be the most important things we do, but for the moment, they're what we can see. And so number one, you're setting your team up with clarity so that they know how they can contribute, right? When you all split off and you're a team and like they go do their thing, when they come back and they've completed it, now you get this sense of like, each of them has a sense of I'm a part of the team, I am contributing and um, we are moving forwards together. And so this is one of the funny ways in which, again, like focus can be really linked to uh, how confident or motivated a team is. And you yeah. might think those are separate things in leadership, but it turns out when you can actually tell a team, here's the goal as best we know it. And sometimes you have much better clarity about the goal. So you say that, but you also say, here's what we're prioritizing. Here's your role. Here's how you're going to contribute. And sometimes it's more of a dialogue than that, but like, that clarity matters and helps people know how to win as a team. And it turns out winning as a team is one of the best ways to create like a team connection. Yeah. It's not a ropes course. It's not like, I don't know, some like team party. It's actually like doing work, doing challenging things together and being successful at it and each being better. So I, I thought you brought up a lot of great things. And again, they tie into different buckets. And, and that's what's really interesting about performance science. It's multidisciplinary and it creates these upward cycles. Also can create downward cycles. Uh, yeah. But you can get really good at doing things wrong. <laughs> compound in the wrong direction. Yeah, I've been there. I think most entrepreneurs have. So I want to talk a little bit about your origin story, right? How you got into performance coaching, especially from a surgeon, right? So every good comic book hero has an origin story. It's the thing that made you into the hero you are today. And we want to hear that story. Were you born a hero? Were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you want to, you know, start a business? Or did you start in a job? I know you said you started as a, as a surgeon, but we want to know where you came from. How did you get here? Yeah, you know, this may relate to other questions we're going to talk about later, but I did not start out wanting to be an entrepreneur. In fact, I think I understood, like, you know, as a kid, you're like, okay, I am going to need a job <laughs> to do something. You know, you, you have to provide some value to society so you can put food on your table. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's just, that's just a, a part of it. And, and also, yeah. you know, you need to be able to independently just survive in the world. But I, like, I grew up, like, in the Pacific Northwest. My, my family was, like, we went backpacking a lot. That was, like, our, our vacation. Definitely built some toughness into me at a very early age because yeah. like, we had three kids. And as soon as you could be walking and carrying anything, you were carrying something. If it was, like, a teddy bear and a our, our kids do the same thing. They had a North Face backpack that was like a one-year-old size backpack. And be like, if they can walk, they can hold their own bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, and we would go out for like a week at a time and carry all our food, all everything we needed to survive for the week or longer. So definitely built some toughness in me. But I think from about the time of being like fifth grader, I started to be very interested in what I would now say is performance. But I just wanted to understand, like, how was it that people were good at whatever they were doing? That could be, like, how did the social, like, groups get set up? Like, why was someone who was, mm -hmm. you know, why were certain people friends? Like, how could you be friends with the person that you wanted to be friends with? But it also was like, okay, the track meet. 
if you want to like, if you want to win like the hundred meter dash, how do you do that? Should you warm up in the morning? Should you train? Like I started to think about and observe these things in a very fifth grader way. But I think like this fascination just continued. And I, at some point really got the sense that I both was terrified of doing challenging things, but loved doing challenging things because I would finish them and I would feel stronger and more capable. So, you know, you can, you can imagine like in the hero's journey, the montage of like, you know, they come in totally unable to yeah. do anything and they get trained. We call that the great suckitude in our family. The great suckitude. Yes. So I had a middle school class with a teacher who made us do insane physical challenges. It was an alternate PE class. She had like 11 and 12 year olds walking uh, 55 miles in 24 hours. Like, Whoa. Uh, we like the average human days. limits, like 22 miles in a, in a day. Yeah. We trained for a half marathon. One day we ran 29 miles from Seattle to Tacoma. I mean, we stopped and took breaks, but we finished. I mean, that's nuts. Hours. Yeah. Yeah. So she really toughened us up and I think that was really the start of understanding that if one could figure out how to do really challenging things that one could, I mean, almost like one could make someone a superhero if you just like yeah. putting yourself up against that stuff. So fast forward, like, you know, I loved math and science. I also was pretty interested in human beings and ultimately was like learned about these MD PhD programs, wanted to have a career that really like helped people. And this is how I ended up in a nine year, fortunately it was funded program to get an MD and a PhD. And I was like, this is the best. Like I'm learning something interesting, yeah. it's challenging, but I have a lot of autonomy, which probably should have been my first cue that this was not how the story was gonna end. Like I would study on my own time. I also played high level ultimate Frisbee during this nine year period. So I Me won too. World championship. I won a world championship and multiple national championships on the side because I just managed my time. Might as well, right? Might as well just be a national championship while I'm studying for my PhD. But That's totally normal. I say this because this is like how my brain works. I would see something and I was like, God, if I could be a sports pro and also a doctor, like that would be amazing. And I just, it just grabbed me. Like that was that's the kind of person I am. And ultimately, some of this came home to roost as I was getting into residency, which is when you really lose all flexibility of your time because I was yeah. in a general surgery residency. Program, and I loved the challenge of surgery. Again, did I end up there? Like, I, it was like, what are the hardest specialties you can practice? And how fascinating are they? And hopefully your life was easier than Meredith Gray's because everyone around her died. Oh, <laughs> jeez. That program, man, I will tell you, no one looks as good as when they are actually an intern. As all the people on that show, because they're all just like straight out of, you know, iconic magazines. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone is too tired to do anything except for just get them to sleep. <laughs> but at any rate, yeah, you know, you're working 80 to 100 hour weeks. And, you know, I think one of the things that I really came to realize was that number one, it's, it is a constrained system, like our healthcare system is under challenge, right? And also, I think this is when I started to realize that I loved organizing my own time and I mm -hmm. wanted to be potent with my time, but like absolutely willing to be ambitious, absolutely willing to work very, very hard, but that there were a number of things that I were just naturally how I would have chosen to do things like in that setting that weren't going to be helpful in that setting. Like if you're a person who's thinking about performance or like, oh, how should we do things here? How should you treat a patient? Like what would be the best way to get a good outcome for them? Like in terms of like that patient care piece or there just wasn't time. And I think for me, that was a real challenge. If you're like, I like talking with people about decision-making or being able to spend some time with them. And I think for me, the other thing I was realizing is that maybe I was more interested in performance than I actually was interested in medicine. I was more interested in the challenge of things just generally than I was about this specific practice. You were interested in the art of mastery itself. Yes. Well put. And that's when I realized I needed a practice outside of medicine. 
that was more entrepreneurial, that I had total freedom to design how I wanted it to work, what would be the methodology. Um, and so I made a very unpopular decision. <laughs> I finished the year. I told them I was going to finish. I said, I'm going to leave at the end of the year. And, and I left. And that's not something very many people do. Um, yeah, not from surgical residencies. Not like, those are hard programs to get into. You don't just leave them. <laughs> and I knew it was the right decision. It was not an easy decision to make. Because, again, it's it's hard for other people to understand. But, and then I started at zero, and built something again. So that, but this was not in the plan. <laughs> like, going into performance coaching, leaving a medical program was never in the plan. But I actually think many things led made me very equipped to actually do that. It was still absolutely challenging. Lots of things, to, lots of mountains to scale, but some of the things I'm most proud of, I've accomplished actually during that phase of my career. So, I, I actually wrote something this morning about mastery that I think I, I, I won't read you the whole thing because it's a whole long post, but there's a piece of it that I think you might really appreciate. Um, and basically, let me see if I can find that find the piece of it. Because to master something, to truly master it, isn't about dominance; it's about submission. Submission to the process, to the practice, to the countless hours spent toiling in the quiet. Quiet. It's about offering yourself up to something greater than you, and in so doing, becoming greater yourself. Mastery, then, is not just a human value. It's the human value. It's the way we push against the tide of entropy, the way we, re um, we resist the pull of mediocrity. It's how we move from survival to significance and from existence to essence. In a world where machines will do everything better, faster, and more precisely than we ever could, it's tempting to ask what's left, her up, left for us. The answer is mastery, not because we need to compete with the machines, but because in the act of mastering something, we remind ourselves of who we are. We are the ones who create, not because it's efficient, but because it's meaningful. We are the ones who pursue mastery, not for what it produces, but for what it makes of us. And that is something that no machine will ever replicate. Mm -hmm. Anyways, it just sounds like it would be something you would res resonate with, that you are fascinated by the pursuit of mastery. Mm -hmm. I thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think it is, it is the meta. I've been fascinated by the meta of performance and love trying out and, and, and being in challenging arenas. I've learned a lot from being in them, but like, yeah, it's, it's the meta of it. It's not about, you know, I, I stopped playing ultimate Frisbee after 10 years. It was great. And, and then I moved on to other things. I, I have a question for you because I feel like you might be very similar to me in this. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. I have a propensity to what I call collect hobbies or collect skills. Like I collect skills the way other people collect stamps. And it's not like, like I like to get good enough at something that someone else might be like, wow, you're really good at that. But like, I'm never like in the realm of like the true masters, right? Like, you know, I, you know I've done a, done a whole bunch of carpentry and like, I built the desk that I'm sitting at here and I built all the cabinets and I built our tables and I built our benches and I built my kids' beds. And I was like, well, that was fun. And now I have like that skill set. None of them look nearly as good as like my stepdad, who's a professional work, woodworker, would have done. But anyone who looks at him is like, wow, you did pretty good, right? I got the same thing going with carpentry, piano playing, you know, calligraphy. You know, there's a few, there's a few, few things that I'm like really, really good at it, writing and photography. Like those are some of like, I've been spending 30 years doing those things, really good at them. But I really like the the challenge of learning something new and going through that, going, well, I call it the great suckitude, going through that great suckitude period of learning a new skill because that, that process fascinates me to no end. And, and I don't really know why, I just know that I love it. And it's the thing that I love more than almost anything else. And it is going through that, like learning a new skill and picking it up and, and being bad at something and realizing that like, it doesn't really matter what it is. The process is almost always the same of how you get good at something. And I don't know, I've always really liked that. And it, I don't know, it kind of makes you feel limitless. <laughs> I, I definitely have a track record of like different things. Mostly it might be a little bit focused in the sense it was often like different athletic things. Like I wrote for mm -hmm. college and I walked on because they were taking walk-ons. So I was like, great, I'm going to do that. <laughs> but I, I think... It, it has always been focused. I'm definitely more aware now of like, there is a limit to the number of like, even athletic hobbies that I can practice. Uh, yeah, so you, you have to, you get to a certain level and you have to put them down and do something else. So. <laughs> so there are a couple of things that I wanted to uh, bring up. 
one, I love that you were in Ultimate Frisbee. I did that through college as well. I, uh, my uh, best friend at the time, we used to get up every morning at like as soon as the sun came up and like you could like see your hand in front of your face kind of light. Then we would go outside and we'd play Frisbee and we would play Frisbee until school started and then we would go all the way through school and then after school was out we would play frisbee until like we started getting hit in the face with the frisbee because we couldn't see it anymore and that's when we would know like when i can't see it anymore that's when we were done (laughs) it's time to go eat dinner or go go in and so i was at the time i was you know we were when you play ultimate frisbee you run a lot and so i was like running like eight hours a day and my roommate at the time was a uh, power lifter and he was like you should come to the gym with me and like bulk up and i was like that's never going to happen like I'm never going to bulk up. Right. But anyways, he took me to the gym and I remember the, the, you know, they do like the intro with the gym and they're like, here's all the things. And you know, what are your goals and blah, blah, blah. And the guy at the gym who owned the gym was like, if I see you come in here and do any sort of cardio, I will kick you out immediately. <laughs> cause I, cause I was at like 3% body fat. And he was like, you were allowed to do muscle building, but no, no cardio in my gym <laughs> because I played a little bit of Frisbee a lot. <laughs> oh, good. So. Yeah, I my team captain was like, no more distance running for you, only sprints. That was that was what I got on our team. Yeah. I was a distance runner like growing up, and so I could do lots of running. I had great courtesy. See, you got to do it like professionally, like on a team. We didn't have a team; we were a small college, so it was like it was me and my best friend that like we put together the you know every every week we had you know we brought kids from campus to go play ultimate frisbee in the front and you know we'd be the team captains we had you know 20 people a week that would play with us kind of thing but yeah it was just that was our hobby i guess spreading the joy (laughs) we were spreading the joy yeah we got we had a, a tire swing on the front of campus on a big tree and we used to practice through the tire swing and so we would play frisbee like we would swing the tire swing and play frisbee through the swinging tire and we got to the point where we could like swing and spin the tire and play frisbee through it um which was super fun so which i guess it reminds me like the, your whole story just sort of it touches on something that i i've been i've been exploring a lot lately with a lot of conversations and i'm curious your thoughts on this because you know you've you've actually got some study into the medical side of this and other things and it's this idea that we don't really know what human potential is. We have ideas, but every time we have someone who puts a requisite amount of attention on any particular limit, we find that we don't know what that limit is. And and I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, because the more I've studied it, the more I've looked into this idea of human beings limitless, the more I've realized that we've never really found limits that we haven't been able to push. And so maybe human capability is a box inside of a box and the, the, you know, we, we can only see what our current capabilities are, but our potential is the box outside of that. And we don't know what those limits are. And every time we push on our capabilities, we find that we don't actually know what the limits are. I suspect that there, the law of diminishing returns exists as a, as a mathematical relationship for this, Mm -hmm. but that we don't know where we are. on. Yeah. So like we may think we are, right at the edge where it's really, really diminishing. But I don't think we know that. So I think my point is, is that generally I agree with you that we don't totally know where the limit is. Doesn't mean there isn't a limit. And so this yeah. might diverge on this piece, but but I don't think we know where we are in the curve, but I think we assume often that like, oh, we're at the edge when in fact we're not yet. Maybe we're not. I think it's I think it's the same it's... beliefs about what is cap- what are the capabilities as we age. Um, I mm-hmm. think there's a lot of data to say that on average, what are people doing? Like when does physical activity start to tail off with age? But I don't know that that's a given. I think that yeah, maybe... Jack Lane slams from the English Channel at 96, so right? <laughs> I, I this is I agree with you that I think there's some really interesting questions here. And some ideas that are worth challenging. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating conversation. And I would love to have, like, we're, we're discussing starting a second podcast specifically called Limitless, just to sort of explore that whole idea. Because you're, I, you're absolutely right. There, there probably are limits in every category. But I think we're maybe not capable of knowing what they are, which means that we'll always sort of push on what we think our capabilities are, which functionally means that we should approach the world like we are limitless right prepare for that idea yeah and prepare for it so and i think that i think that fits nicely into the idea of like how do you 
operate at peak performance because we're talking about like, hey, you know, if you want to be able to sleep better or you want to be able to, you know, do more work with your business, like any any of the categories where you want to have more performance, right? You're you're looking at like, hey, here's what you think your capabilities are. Let's push on those capabilities and see if you can push them past where the where the current limits are. And you find that I think the important thing here is that it isn't just about like push in unlimited areas because mm -hmm. We have this limit of how much time do we have each day? And everyone has that limit. Um, yeah. And then you have the the limits around, all right, you could push harder in this area, but it's coming from somewhere. And so yeah. you have to like you have to balance those things. And that's this that's the probably the most important part of the discussion of being limitless, that there's there's only one real limit and it's human attention. Right? And the attention is is it's how much time you have to put towards something or collectively how much time we together as a team or as a community have to put towards a, you know, a certain endeavor. And so human attention is the limiting factor that we have. So, you know, if you're going to give more attention to one thing, it's going to come from something else. Like that's, <laughs> that's the limit. <laughs> so that's interesting. So I want, I want to talk then about your superpowers, right? Every, every hero, every iconic hero has a superpower, whether that's your fancy flying suit made by your genius intellect or your ability to call down thunder from the sky or your super strength or maybe your ability to throw a frisbee, right? In the real world, heroes have what I call a zone of genius, which is either a skill or a set of skills that you were born with or you've developed over time that sort of energize all your other skills. And so the superpower is what really sets you apart and allows you to help your people slay their villains and come out on top on their own journeys. The way I like to frame it for my guests is if you look at like all the skills that you've developed over the course of your very storied life, what are the common threads that sort of tie all of those like skills or accomplishments together? And that common thread is probably where you'd find your superpower. So what do you think your superpower is today? Well, I think, I think the superpower, it's, it's a combination of things. Um, it, as it turns out, I'm quite smart. <laughs> I don't think it was always, I don't think that was always apparent, but I think one of the, the it's, I have some taste or some particular intelligence around performance as it turns out. And I know this because you see it as early as fifth grade, but the thing is I was able to reach a high level of success starting over in many different fields that were not necessarily linked together. They spanned from playing music growing up at a, at a high level to like athletic performance, but across multiple sports. I, mm -hmm. I was a distance runner when I was in high school, but I walked onto the rowing team, like a nationally ranked rowing team. I then switched to an entirely different thing, played ultimate frisbee and like made a team. We went to national championships. We won them. I won a beach world, uh, like a oh, world championship, a beach ultimate. Like, but there was also the scholastic, like there was the medicine side, there was the science side. Those are not necessarily the same kind of performance. So I have an intelligence around being able to come into a new space, identify what it is that is considered high performing, like what are the standards, but also then identify how is it that people are doing that thing? Like what are the techniques? What's most important to be investing in? And sometimes it's not obvious. For example, sometimes you need to be to have work success, to be both investing in social relationships as well as your actual work performance, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so performance is a complicated thing in that in that way, but I have always had the ability to come into a new space, spot how things worked, like figure out how they worked, and then use that to then rise to a very high level. Like the highest level, like maybe not, it depends how, how much time I actually spent doing that thing but this is this is what i think is my superpower it's a yeah. particular kind of intelligence and i even used it for the scholastic things that most people would say is just related to iq or this or that but like even watching like no one in my so, school is a doctor I just went to i have a i have a couple of thoughts for you because i think some of them might be useful because i think i think we share a superpower in that arena I, i've always called it the ability to see the systems behind things right and so yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm a photographer, have been for 30 years. So it's one of the things that I, has never lost my attention in the realm of sort of like, I, I do the same kind of thing where I'm like, I can enter an arena and then get really good at it really fast, like much to the uh, chagrin of the people who are already there. And they're like, 
that should take you two years to learn, not six weeks. Like, how did you do that? And I think a lot of it is that that ability to identify what's happening that other people can't necessarily see. So just to to use the the, the photography example, I, my wife sometimes finds it frustrating to watch movies with me because I analyze the story and I analyze all the cinematography and the music score and all the things that are happening there. And I'd be like, I'd be like, they've got two different lights on this scene. One's over here, one's here. This is the type of lens that they're using. It evokes this kind of emotion. They've got this kind of music, this kind of stuff that's happening with the story. The character arc does this kind of thing. Like, and can with, with almost like scientific rigor, like predict what's the next scene's gonna happen and like the entire story all the way through. This is and- fantastic because I like, <laughs> in, in my own life, I have a fictitious TikTok channel that is called this is this is why this is high performing with Carla Fowler in which yeah. I analyze everything from like my takeout leftover lunch why is this mm-hmm. why is this so good to you know why is this chair I'm sitting in at the cafe like the best chair <laughs> so I can resonate with your analysis of like oh here's why the lights and the lighting of this is great here's why it's not great yeah like all the way through and and it's just it's just this like you see you see the world differently than I don't want to say normal people because I like I don't know that it's normal or abnormal it just is the way that we're wired right and everyone's got their own wiring to see the world in the way that they see it and like that very specific like you can see the matrix right (laughs) like you can see the code that's making it happen so it's really easy for you to identify like oh I need to do these things in this way to get this result I'm other people like how did you come to that conclusion the rest of us had to go through the great suckitude like for 20 years (laughs) That I like how you did that. Yeah, and it resonates. Yeah. yeah, it's and it it's an interesting it's it's an interesting superpower. I've only met a few people who have it. And the other side of that is, have you ever? So my wife has her degree in uh, early childhood education and psychology and a couple other things. And one of the things that she broke down for me, which helped that really helped me understand where the whole, you know, IQ versus like like you know, am I smart or like what is going on here? And have you ever heard the distinction between someone being bright versus being gifted? No, I haven't. So it's two categories and the the IQ distribution is very similar, right? So if you're looking into your kids, so your IQ distribution is bell curve, obviously, right? And when you get to the right side of the bell curve, where people are starting to get into the higher IQs, 130s plus, they tend to bifurcate into two different groups, right? And the overwhelming majority of them, 80% plus, are going to end up in the bright category and then the smaller subset are going to end up in the, the gifted category. And the difference between the two is someone who's bright, if you ask them a question, you know, what is one plus one, they'll respond with an answer, two. If you ask a gifted person, what is one plus one, they're going to ask you, they're going to return with another question, right? They're going to be like, why are you asking that question? Like, what are, you know, what are the parameters? Is it like one plus one in a mathematical sense? Like I have one egg and two eggs and they got another one. Or are we talking like if you have one husband and one wife and they get together, like maybe they have six, right? That's what our family was. It was one, one and we have six, right? Like, like you didn't give me enough information to answer the question. And so there's beyond the question that there might be many different yeah, frames in which that, that there's a lot of different frames. And so that's the, the gifted category. What's interesting is a lot of times the gifted category, people actually be lower on the IQ scale than the bright the bright kids are. But the gifted category kids, that's where you'll end up with your savants, right? Your savants are almost always in the gifted category. So like the ones who are, you know, like your Einsteins or your Sheldon Coopers from, you know, (laughs) the Big Bang Theory. And it's that that distinction is the ask a question, give an answer, ask a question, ask more questions. And that was really helpful for understanding sort of like my own, like how my brain works, because I'm definitely in that second category of like, it's almost impossible for you to ask me a question and me not to follow up with more questions. I just, I can't give you the answer. I have more things that I need to know. I, having, having models to understand yourself in models can be really hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to flip gears, right? If we talked a little bit about your superpower, your superpower is your ability to see the systems, then the flip side of that, of course, would be your fatal flaw, right? And every super, Superman has this kryptonite Every Wonder Woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad. You probably have a flaw that's held you back in your business, something you struggled with. For me, it's things like perfectionism, right? As you can probably tell with all of my ideas, I'm like, I want to make it better. Everything from, you know, that would, that would affect shipping product to lack of self-care, which, you know, I let my clients walk all over me or let my time walk all over me. And so I think more important than what the flaw is, is how have you worked to overcome it so that you could continue to get the results that you're getting in your business and that you get for your clients. And hopefully sharing a little bit of your story will help our audience 
you know, sort of see their flaws in a different light? Well, it's a really great question. And I think one of the clearest answers to me is just when you are a high capacity person and when you understand performance and you understand what good performance looks like, one of the challenges is it is hard to not say, well, I should then do that in every area at every moment of every day. But one of the interesting things about that, so whether you call that perfectionism or or something else, the challenge is that one piece of focus is what do you choose to do? What do you not do at all? That's one way we can think about focus and, you know, using our capacity to the fullest, figuring out what, what you're going to do and all the things you're not going to do. But there's another way to think about focus, which is that you're going to need to do some things and some of them are going, you need to, you're going to need to do them at like 15th percentile. Yeah. Not 110th percentile, right? Like there are many things. Like, like I just need to do the bookkeeping until I can hire or afford a bookkeeper. I'm never going to be great at it. Yeah. It's going to be imperfect. In fact, my taxes are probably like, I mean, I've been assured by accountants that like you can't do your taxes perfectly, even if you are endeavoring to do so. So there are just things you have to get them done, whatever they are. Um, and that not everything can get 100% of your effort or of your performance, nor does it need it. So I think one of the ways I really come to combat this, because it can start to suck up your capacity, is to try and build in, number one, learning curves for myself. Because one of the challenges is if you always want to have something be at a very high level because you have very high standards, well, then it becomes hard to do new things. So one of the techniques I've used is to build learning curves into new, into new projects. So for example, when I started like being interviewed on podcasts, that was a new thing. And one of the ways I thought about it was like, well, I should go seek out a lot of podcasts and just build in enough repetitions over time that I get better at it. And for anyone in the audience who wants to hear the difference, they are all on my website which we'll put the URL in the notes, you can go back and they are dated and you can see me learning in public. Yeah. But one of the things is, you know, if you stack up enough time that you will get better. Human beings, we are learning machines. We want to get better. So I think that was one of the things that both helped me create and share content that I really wanted to, like ideas that I thought would really help people, but also help me learn. And um, because I was willing to learn in public, I was able to do two things at once. But I knew I would come up that. So sometimes yeah. one of the things I do is I try to build that. So what I love about that, I love your example with the podcast, by the way, mostly because, you know, we run a podcast post-production company, so it's wonderfully self-serving for us. But the, the, the podcast piece in particular is it's really useful because it, sh it, it, shows, it shows a very particular thing. We talked about going through the great suckitude and like you're not really ready until you start taking the action, right? There's no way that you can get good at being interviewed on podcasts until you go and get interviewed on podcasts, right? And so you go through that process of like, hey, I just have to do the work to get better at this. And when you do the practice, you start to find out, you know, when I tell the stories, I get these kind of reactions. So maybe I change the story a little bit this time. Maybe I change it a little bit this way. You start to realize what are the details that are important when I'm sharing a story? What's the pacing that actually like I can use when I'm on camera? How do I reduce the number of times I'm saying in awe and actually instead maybe have thoughtful silence, right? And, you know, as you're, you're like, those are all things that you learn from practice, from actually doing the work. And, and it's because it's in public, it's really cool for not only for yourself, but for other people, you could go back and actually like look at your interviews. And I can tell you, you know, if you go back and look at this show, this show's on its like 300th plus interview, right? If you go back 300 interviews ago, it was five years ago or six years ago now, like, first off, I look like a baby because, you know, <laughs> I was I was younger back then. I'm like, wow. But second of all, like, it's vastly different. My my camera and lighting setup is terrible. My microphone is terrible. My ability to interview people is, you know, it's so so. And but you put in a lot of repetitions, you start to get really good at it and you can see that progress. And you can do the same thing with almost any YouTuber creator. You can go, you know, you look at what's his name, Mr. Beast. You know, he's a big, famous YouTuber. And you go look at his videos now versus like his first ones that he put out 10 years ago. You look really different because you get better when you put in the when you put in the reps. The Hero Show will be right back. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. 
I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done for you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. Now back to the hero show. So I know we're we're sort of running out of our time here, but I do have one more question I want to ask you, and it is about your guiding principles, right? One of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code. For instance, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever brings them to Arkham Asylum. You know, or if you know uh, too much about Peter Parker, he uh, always pulls his punches because he's afraid he'll hurt people, right? So as we wrap up the interview, I want to talk about the top one or two principles that you use regularly in your life. Maybe something you wish you had known when you first started out on your own hero's journey. This is a great question. Well, one of the meta principles that I think a lot about is that two of the best levers that we have to pull in our lives around our performance. Well, one is a lot of our results come down to how we spend our time and how we feel. Like those two things basically encompass our experience. And yeah. um, I like that because it's very simple and I can always ask myself, whatever challenge I am in, like, all right, do I want to work on how I'm spending my time or do I want to work on how I am feeling about what is happening? So often how we spend our time is how we actually change what's happening. But yeah. sometimes what is happening is perfectly normal and fine. So for example, when I started my practice, like they don't teach you business in school and I had to learn how to sell. I had to go out and network. I had to tell people what I was doing, answer a lot of questions. And I did not pitch like a pro in those ways. Did it feel good? No, it did not feel good. <laughs> you know, at, at 35, when you're like post one career starting the next, like that never feels good. And yet if I looked at how I was spending my time, I, I had brutal, I was using brutal focus and I decided that the two things I needed to focus on for at least the first three years were that I needed to focus on my coaching and making sure that that was absolutely at the highest level it could be. And I needed to focus on learning how to sell. Yeah. Those were the two things, no blog, no social media, no, no, none of it all. Like there were so many distractions that could have gotten in the way. Yeah. It was like, you need to learn how to sell. There's product and selling it. There's making stuff and there's selling stuff. That is what there is in business. <laughs> the principle. I That's a hundred percent accurate. I, uh, <laughs> I approve. I'm Richard Matthews and I approve this message. <laughs> the seal of approval. So uh, I applied brutal focus and I said, how are you going to spend your time? Because the more time you can put in on these things, the faster you will be in a place where you feel that. Mm -hmm. But there are other things where sometimes one's perspective needs to change. There's not something different you need to do about your time. You may just need to have a different perspective um, and, and say, oh, okay. Like, how am I, how am I going to feel about learning in public? Right? Like, this is a great way to be learning. I'm excited to be on podcasts. Like, okay. How are you going to feel about that when you listen to an episode and you're like, oh, I said, so many times. <laughs> Which still happens sometimes. But um, so I just think it's a useful thing I go back to again and again. Uh, for example, sometimes the best thing you can do for yourself if you're going through a challenging time or even if it's just a normal day, you can ask yourself, what will help me build a good day today? And that's about time usage. It might be to say, well, 
I'm going to hug the people I love. I am going to make sure that I sit down and I actually do a solid eight hours towards the thing I, you know, the work or whatever it is I am working towards. I want to exercise. I want to get to bed on time. And tomorrow will look different. But like, yeah. there's there's some real beauty in saying, "Am I using time?" Or, like, "How am I feeling about something?" And are there some other perspectives I could take that might change how I feel? Or is the perspective to take to say, "I'm feeling this today," and it's quite possible after a night's sleep, I will not be feeling that tomorrow, and that is what there is, right? Like feelings no. will be without. So I think those are the guiding <laughs> principles that I like. I... I love that. That especially that last one. I always re refer to that last one about you know feelings. We call that the truth train in our house. And so the truth train, right? You have, the, you have your engine of the train. That's the truth, like what's actually going. And then you have the you know all the things that are happening. That's the body of the, the train. You have the caboose. The caboose is the feelings, and the feelings are a part of the train. They're real. They exist. You can go stand in the caboose. You can ride in the back of the train. Like the whole thing. Like you're. And a lot of people try to dismiss their feelings. Like no, your feelings are a part of your experience, but you don't drive the train with the feelings. Right, you drive the train with the truth, and so I I love that. And then the the other part about about shifting your perspective, right? You can either change what you're doing, or you can change how you feel about what you're doing. And I I love that. I've never really heard it put that way. But you talked a little bit about like sales. So, you know, businesses is, is making products and selling products. And I know just because again we, we've run the show for a long time, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with this is the perspective around sales. You get into business. And they have this negative perception of sales, that sales is this bad thing. It's smarmy or it's slimy or it's, you know, used car salesman and hurting people. And, and, but you know, you have to get good at it. And one of the things that helped me a lot in that shift from my own perspective was realizing that sales actually isn't this slimy, smarmy thing. Sales is someone else has a problem that is currently hurting them. And I have a solution to that problem. And sales is how you connect that problem to that solution. Right? It's how I can save them, how I can make their world a better place. The only way that you can really provide your value to the world, your perspective and your skills and the things is with sales. Sales is the mechanism by which value is exchanged. Yeah. And we are all in the business of sales. So even if you are not an entrepreneur, like we have to sell our ideas. We have to sell ourselves for promotions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every conversation to like get your kid into bed at the right time. That is a sales conversation. <laughs> <laughs> or or convincing your mom that you want to go to the movie theater and watch this movie instead of the other one, right? Or your wife at my age, right? Like, how about this action movie instead of the romantic comedy, right? It's sales. It's sales. It's all sales. So it is a, yeah, it's a way of communicating and it's a way of having your impact. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much for taking, coming on our show. I'm going to wrap our interview there. I do finish every interview with a very simple, something I call the hero's challenge. And uh, the Heroes Challenge, we do this basically to help get access to stories we might not otherwise find on our own. So the question is simple. Do you have someone in your life or in your network that you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come and share their story with us here on The Hero Show? First person that comes to mind for you. First person that comes to mind to me, a woman in my network named Julie. And she runs a very interesting business around leadership and training and development all around respect. Oh, and cool. How we can show respect, how we receive respect and and run. I, I love it. Like she has a team and has some really interesting ideas about how we often most most games are multiplayer games um, versus like independent projects and has some really interesting and and her background is super interesting. She has like uh, she has a PhD in history and plus so very interesting. Person. Well, awesome. Well, we'll see if we can get, you know, connect afterwards and get an introduction to her. Maybe she can come on the show. They don't always do, but when they do, sometimes we get some really cool interviews we might not otherwise get for the show. So I appreciate that. And so, you know, our send off here, you know, in comic books, there's always the crowd of people at the end who are cheering, cheering and clapping for the acts of heroism. So our analogous to that as we close is where can people find you if they want your help in the future? Where can they light up the bat signal and say, you know, hey, Dr. Carla, I would love to, you know, get your help with my performance. But I think more important than where or who are the right types of people to actually reach out and ask for that help? Well, uh, generally speaking, I work with people across industries as well as um, different levels of leadership. Typically, I would say the common thread is people who are setting ambitious goals for themselves and who are looking for 
it's that level of tools, like who want to see behind the curtain to say, how do I go about this deliberately and really push my performance, push the goals. Generally, these folks have a level of responsibility and autonomy that they have the ability to make some of those decisions for themselves, whether it's the department they lead or it's not a fixed career level per se. And a great place to connect with me, there are two. One is my website, which is thaxa.com, T-H-A-X-A. And that is fun because I have a great FAQ section, but I also have all my podcasts. If you want to hear me learning in public, you can go check those out and you can message me through the site. But another place is LinkedIn. So I'm always posting content when I have a conversation about performance science, I put it up there. And uh, I'm at Carla Dash Fowler. So if you want to follow along, hear more about performance science, that's a great spot. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today. I appreciate you taking the time to share your story, Carly. And do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience before we hit this stop record button here? Oh, man, I feel like we, we used some But I, I, I'll come back to time because I think, you know, how we spend our time is how we spend our life. And so I think time is absolutely worth thinking about, spending time, working on it, planning it, understanding how your, how your time makes you feel. And yeah. it, is, it is a worthwhile thing to geek out on, to spend some time on. Because human attention is the only real limited resource that we're aware of. Bring it all together. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Hero Show, where we work to shift the cultural narrative around entrepreneurship and celebrate the heropreneurs who make our world a better place. Don't forget to visit our website at theheroshow.tv where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in our show, we'd truly appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or better yet, share it with a friend to help us spread the message of entrepreneurship as a force for good. Curious to learn more about the stories and insights of these incredible heropreneurs? Check out our in-depth interviews and resources on our website. Together, let's support and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs as they embark on their own heroic journeys. Join us again next week for another episode of The Hero Show, where we'll continue to explore the world of heropreneurs, their superpowers, and the positive impact they bring to our lives. Until then, stay heroic.